Father, as we come before you today, I'm, I am grateful for the uh, privilege of teaching your word, thankful that you have left us with your authoritative word, you have uh, preserved it throughout history, you've given us the spirit to help us understand it, you've given us minds to keenly sort through things, and you don't leave us in the dark when it comes to revealing yourself to us. And so we are thankful that this church, in all of its contexts, from Monday morning moms groups to Tuesday morning men's study, right now in the Sunday school classes with the children, in the theology class down the hall, uh, we are always in your word. And um, when we depart from that, when we fail to allow your word to speak to us, um, it's a failure that we, we just can't do as a church. So thank you that we can come to you through your word. I ask this morning that you would help me uh, to preach it well and that you would use the hearing of your word in the lives of each person today. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> usually we don't want to remember our most embarrassing moments. Uh, I don't know why I'm going to tell you mine, but uh, I will. A number of years ago, Ferris and I were serving with a Christian organization, and we were at a summer training in Colorado. We spent six of our married summers, I believe, in Colorado in different kinds of training. And, and we were gathered together with a bunch of us from the Northwest that were serving on campuses around the Northwest. And um, one of the wives was having a very difficult pregnancy. And uh, she happened to be in the hospital, and they did a very unique surgery. They actually took the baby out and set it aside and, and removed a tumor and fixed some things and put the baby back. It was astounding. This was, you know, 20-some years ago. And so her husband called me and gave me a report. They weren't in Colorado. They were in Portland, and he called and gave a report. And so I was... Uh, the, the group was gathered, and we were going to pray for her, and I was giving a report, and I said, well, the surgery went well. The doctors have her heavily seduced, and, <laughs> and everybody laughed like that, and I was, I was like, you heartless people, I, how can you laugh at this? And it took me a second to realize that I didn't say sedated, I said seduced, and I don't know if that's my most embarrassing moment, but it ranks right up there. <clears throat> and words, I use words all the time. On occasion, I get them right. Um, <laughs> but the reason I share that little story is today, we see Nebuchadnezzar, in my opinion, probably his most embarrassing season of his entire royal regal life. And I found it interesting that he, uh, he is willing to divulge that to us uh, thousands of years later, we read his story of conversion, and it's a story of conversion that's wrapped around uh, social embarrassment. Um, so where we find ourselves now in chapter 4, just to give you a little bit of history, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came to Babylon as... Uh, um, they were captured and brought to Babylon in their teen years. They've been there now 25 to 30 years, so they're no longer boys. They're somewhere between 40 and 45 years old. Uh, last week, we looked at the story of uh, the three men unwilling to bow down to the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made, and they survived the fiery furnace, and God met them there, and it was a tremendous testimony to Nebuchadnezzar and all those that were watching. That's sort of the last we'll hear of those three men. The rest of the book of Daniel now deals with Daniel and primarily the visions that God gives Daniel to help us understand uh, the unfolding of human history and then the end times. So today, uh, it's a unique passage because it's written by Nebuchadnezzar. It might be the only place in the Bible where, uh, you know, a, a pagan king actually authors of the scripture under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So it's written in the first person. It's his story. Uh, Daniel, interject, or, uh, yeah, Daniel interjects some thoughts here and there. But it's a very unique chapter, and we'll get to see Nebuchadnezzar's story. So it's a long one. So I will start my watch and ignore that, and uh, we'll, just, we'll just get going. 
So we'll start in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So here's his thesis statement. He's, he's writing this chapter. He's, he's, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning he's sitting there with Daniel. This is a flashback. And he says, Daniel, I want to, I want to capture this. I want to write this. And, and so he addresses it to the known world. And we, we now know that at this point, Nebuchadnezzar was the top of the heap. He was the king of the known world. And, and he says, I want your peace to abound. Now, it's probably ironic because he's a, a king that has conquered. And probably a lot of the people that he's conquered aren't experiencing peace. But I think he's talking about a different kind of internal peace that he was not experiencing until, well, you'll hear the rest of the story. And he says, it seems good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is ever an everlasting kingdom and his dominion from generation to generation. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has He's seen the boys say no to his, his food and his wine, and they prospered. He, he has seen the young men, uh, well, he's seen Daniel reveal a dream to him that none of his wise men could do. He saw the three friends of Daniel endure the flaming furnace and come out unscathed. After each of these events, he's given praise to the God of the universe, to the one true God, but in a cultural way, not in a personal way. And so this is a distinct difference today as he, as he tells us, this is what I now believe and what I now understand, and that's this, that he is a God of dominion from generation to generation, and he has an everlasting kingdom. In other words, I understand now my kingdom will not last, but God's will. So let's look at the story. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. And I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. Uh, these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and visions I kept in my mind, in my mind, kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and the conjurers and the Chaldeans and the diviners, they came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of magicians, Since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the vision of my dreams and what I have seen along with its interpretation. Uh, So he he again is he's culturally in the world of Yahweh. He's seen Yahweh perform now, and he understands there's a difference between Yahweh and his gods, but when he finds himself anxious, he's, he says, I'm, I'm in my palace, everything is good, I've conquered the world, I'm done battling, I live in opulence, I have built the gardens for my wife, everything is as it should be, but something's not right with me. And I have this dream, and this dream keeps me awake, and I don't know what it means, and I'm anxious about it. I think there's a lesson to be learned here. You can climb to the top of whatever your pile is. His was government. Yours might be industry. It might be education. It, who knows what it is? We can get to the tops of our careers, and if we are not right with God, things are not right with us. And God is faithful to not allow satisfaction to settle in. There will always be a nagging need in the heart of the unbeliever. I I believe God is faithfully trying to reach those that have yet to know him, and he's doing that with Nebuchadnezzar. He's given Nebuchadnezzar so many opportunities, 
And this apparently is the last one. And so uh, he's, his first reaction, which I find astounding, is he calls his conjurers, his magicians, his sorcerers. He's dealt with these guys a couple of times now and knows good and well they don't know what they're doing. And, but he calls them in anyway, and I think this is indicative of often the, the mind separated from God, the, the heart that's not yet yielded to God, resorts to our old patterns to solve our current problems. Um, all too often, people who are having some turmoil in their life, instead of turning to the God of the universe and understanding the gospel, they turn back to their old religious ways. They turn back to more materialism or more power. They do something as opposed to yield to the God of the universe. And that's what he did first. But then Daniel, he let, and Daniel's now in charge of, I mean, note this, in verse 9, O Belteshazzar, that's his pagan name, chief of the magicians. He's in charge of these guys. Uh, Daniel knows good and well, and I think that's why he hung back. He's like, I'll let those guys go do their thing. They're not going to have the answer. It will demonstrate once again to the king that he's putting his trust in the wrong men because they're not going to be able to perform. So once they've all twiddled their thumbs and come up with false interpretations, Daniel now steps into the room, and the king is like, okay, I know the spirit of the holy God lives in you. I'm going to trust you with the interpretation. Now, I'm just going to read through the dream now. Verse 10. Remember the first dream, he was unwilling to tell it or he didn't remember it. This dream, he remembers clearly and he's willing to tell it. So even having told the dream to the Chaldeans and the sorcerers, uh, they were scratching their heads. They had no idea what the dream meant. Verse 10, now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. And the tree grew large and became strong and its height reached to the sky and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage uh, was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. All living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the vision in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. And he shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its root in the ground, with a band of iron and bronze around it, in the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched in the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is decreed by the angelic watchers, And the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. And he bestows it on whom he wishes and he sets it over the lowliest man. Now this is the dream which I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation. Inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. So he's, he's got great clarity on this dream. He sees it in detail. He's had it over and over again, and he's spending a lot of time in his bed. And he's, he's not liking this because it is causing anxiety. He should be able to rest on his laurels and enjoy his power and his wealth and But something's not right. It keeps nagging at him. And so finally Daniel comes in and he says, okay, here's the dream, and I trust you to interpret it. Okay, let's look at verse verse 19 then. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for, for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. And the king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let, your, let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. 
Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. So Daniel, you know, 45-year-old man now, he's been serving this king since he was a teenager. He's sitting there across from the king. The king recounts the dream to him, and you, you can sense in the king's mind something's happening to Daniel's countenance. As he's recounting the dream, Daniel's understanding what's going on, and he, he is appalled at this. And, and the king is like, okay, Daniel, don't, don't worry. You can, you can tell me what's happening. You can tell me what's going on. And Daniel's response is, oh, king. In other words, you do not know what you're asking. I wish that what's being told about you was being told about your enemies because this is a heavy burden, a heavy weight to bear. And Daniel really doesn't want to interpret the dream for him. Now, I, I'm thinking in my mind there's three reasons for this. There's maybe more, but I, I thought of three. First one is, this is the king of the known universe. And to break bad news to him puts you at great risk. More than once already in this short little four chapters, he's, he's sworn he will tear men limb from limb. He's thrown Daniel's best buddies into a furnace. Uh, he said, I will destroy your homes and your families. Uh, he has ultimate power. He can do whatever he wants. And here's Daniel, the mouthpiece for God. He's hearing this dream and he knows exactly, <coughs> exactly what it means. And his countenance has fallen. And the king, to his credit, notes this and says, wow, you can tell me. That would be the first reason. The second reason would be this. He's served this king now for 25 years. And despite him being a powerful pagan king with false gods and all kinds of immorality, not only within his palace but within the kingdom, Daniel has come to like the guy. He, he sees him as God's leader during this awkward, unique period of time in human history. And he maybe has come to love the guy. Have you ever been in that position? Maybe you've worked for someone that is, uh, you know, a rejecter of Christ, a tough guy or gal to work for, but over time you've come to love them and appreciate them, and you really want their best. Uh, which leads to the third reason, is that Daniel can see what's going to have to happen for God to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. And he, he does not want the pain for Nebuchadnezzar that he's going to have to experience and go through for the reward. He's, he's going, is, is the pain worth the reward? Uh, you've probably been there with someone in your, in your family or your life. You know they've got to hit rock bottom before they'll respond to Christ. They're not responding to Christ yet. They've heard the gospel. They continue to rebel. You, you watch them disintegrate, and, and you go, I don't want to see what the outcome of this is, but maybe God can use it for his glory in the end. Often, we want to intercede and keep the pain from happening. We want to intercede and... and lighten the blow and, and, and take, you know, take that burden upon ourselves and not allow it to happen to our sons or our daughters or our friends. And I'm, I'm sensing that there's part of Daniel that's like, I, I really don't want to see you have to go through what it is you're going to have to go through. But the king encourages him to give a report, and so here's his report. Verse 20. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached the sky and was visible to the earth, to all the earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it is you, O king. For you have become great and grown strong. And your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. And in that you saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, 
yet leave its stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time have passed over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place. Your dwelling place will be with beasts of the field, and you will be given grass to eat like cattle, and you'll be drenched with dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And in this and in that it was commanded to leave a stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. So you're sitting across from the king of the universe. <laughs> you're telling him, hey, that great and grand and glorious tree that is providing for the earth, that's you. Good job. You have, you have reached the pinnacle of power. You are running your kingdom well. People are flourishing under you. Things are good. But you haven't recognized who gave you that power. It's the God of heaven. And so what's going to happen is he's going to take that power away from you. And I don't think the king was fully understanding what's going to happen. here. He's, he's saying, you're not going to live in your palace anymore. You're going to live out in the fields. You're not going to eat steaks and grapes. You're going to eat grass like a cow. Uh, you are going to be drenched with dew. Your fingernails are going to grow out like claws. And your hair is going to be matted. You're going to have a mental breakdown. It, it, this is going to be extremely embarrassing. The king of the universe is going to be grazing in a field like a cow. You get to tell that to the king. I'm, I'm guessing the king is scratching his head like, well, I don't understand. What, are, what in the world are you talking about? But that's the message. And he says, you need to understand that this is going to happen. There's no, unless... You change. This is going to happen. And it's been ordained by the God of heaven. Now, look at verse 27. He says, Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Daniel is communicating to him. He said, you are on a path of destruction. What I just prophesied will happen to you, but there might be, there, maybe there's a way of escape. And that would by be repentant. Uh, come to God. You, you have been exposed to him numerous times. You've cult, you're culturally a part of Yahweh, but you have never, ever submitted to him. There is no change in your behavior. Uh, you, you give lip service to my God, but your behavior has not changed. So in verse 27, he says, stop your sins and do righteousness. Quit being iniquity, quit doing iniquity and show mercy to the poor. These are two hallmarks of the gospel. We're not saved by being righteous or helping the poor, but when we are saved, we become righteous and we care for the poor. And he's saying, you can repent. There is still time. And I'm going to pause right there for just a minute. If you're here this morning and you're culturally around Jesus, you're here because of the enjoyment of the fellowship of the believers here, you, you're curious, you're interested but you have yet to submit yourself to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is still time to repent. Um, and there doesn't have to be the kind of outcomes that we're going to see in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. 
But I'll circle back to that. So let's see what happens. Um, verse 28. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. So now I think Daniel is writing. He says, 12 months later, so a year later, he's had a whole year to consider this dream, its interpretation, and Daniel's exhortation to repent. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace. And the king reflected and he said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? We've had those moments, haven't we? <laughs> Look at that. Didn't I did that. That's pretty amazing. Well, he's standing there, his arms crossed, fresh cup of coffee, I'm sure. He's thinking, Look at the king. And he's looking over at the gardens of Babylon. He's thinking about his wives. <laughs> he's thinking about all that I've done. This is so fantastic. I'm pretty much all that and more. Well, next verse. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it has been declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. <laughs> Can you imagine? You hear a voice and, and all of a sudden your mind clicks in, oh boy, what Daniel told me 12 months ago is happening. That's sort of his last conscious thought. You'll be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle in seven periods. Seven years of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High Ruler, the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, and his hair had grown uh, like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. There's, a, uh, there's actually a condition for this. It's called boanthropy. And it's a mental condition, obviously. It's very rare. Uh, it happens about three times a year. Um, there's a couple of well-known cases, one in England, that a guy lived in his backyard as a cow for years. Um, so really what's happened here is the king of the universe has had a mental break. Now, even if there weren't a condition called boanthropy, I would believe the story to be true. I want to be clear on that. Sometimes it's fun to find that, oh, what happened way back there in the Bible can now be demonstrated in the world of psychiatry. But if it couldn't be demonstrated in the world of psychiatry, guess where my money is? It's on the Bible. It's not on psychiatry. Nothing against psychiatrists. I could probably benefit from one. Um, but the whole issue here is his unwillingness to humble himself before the God of the universe. Now, James tells us God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Proverbs says this, there's six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, pride-filled eyes is number one. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife amongst brothers. Uh, pride is the engine of a long train of sin. I would suggest pride is at the root of every sin. You know, think about it. 
When we break the law of God, when we rebel against our own conscience, when we break the law of society, usually we're saying, that law doesn't apply to me. Um, I've been known to speed a time or two. I'm thinking, well, if I get caught, it's not the end of the world. That, that law, it, it sort of applies to me, but it doesn't. Look, everybody else is doing it. I'll let you fill in the blank. That would not be my worst sin by by the way, um, I'll let you fill in the blank what you feel freedom to do, even though you know it's wrong, but your pride says, it's me. I can do this. I mean, you think about the major sins that divide a home. It's somebody saying, yeah, being faithful in marriage doesn't really apply to me. If you knew how hard it was to live with him or live with her, you'd understand. Therefore, it's, it's, okay. it's pride is what it is. It's, it's like, I, I don't have to love my neighbor. I don't have to love that neighbor. They're well beneath my station. They are not like me. They're, they were raised someplace else. They're different than I am. I, I don't have to love them. That's pride. Um. It, it leads a long train of sin. And here we see it in its most manifest form. He has been handed the kingdom. God has given him authority, and he stands on his balcony ignoring God and saying, look what I have done. I don't know what pride right now is eating away at you and me, but... It will always lead to sin. And it seems to be, based on Scripture, that it's the number one annoying thing. Well, annoying is way too light. <laughs> annoying thing to God. And it divides relationships. It causes global wars. Ethnic pride does. It is a huge, huge issue. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't see it. He, he, he thinks he is worthy of the praise that he's received, and he doesn't recognize it was God's hand. Okay, verse 34. <clears throat> now, and Nebuchadnezzar's writing again. He said, but at the end of that period, that's seven years. Folks, we've been in this building, when it comes to June, we'll have been in this building two years. Add five more years of that and, and picture Nebuchadnezzar in our backyard on his hands and knees grazing. Now, I don't know what they did as, as a kingdom. Um, you know, did they try to cover it up? Did they acknowledge it and say, hey, yeah, I'm sure they had to have one of his sons step in and manage the kingdom during this period of time, but this is... Super awkward and super embarrassing, very humbling, the most humbling thing you can think of, and that's where he finds himself. But at the end of that period of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. See, that's all it took was for him to acknowledge it's God, not me. He raised his eyes to heaven, uh, probably literally, but we're speaking metaphorically here. He says, I recognized it's God who's sovereign, and I am just a human. It is not me. He says, I raised my eyes to heaven, heaven and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. He know, mine's not. His is. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven. And among the inhabitants of earth, no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what hast thou done? <laughs> Again, most powerful man in the world 
couldn't ward off the hand of God. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't say, what have you done to me? God thoroughly humbled him. And he had no say in it, no partnership in it, no participation. He was humbled. And now he recognizes, he puts things in perspective. And he says, it doesn't matter who you are, king of the world or servant of the king, we are nothing. <laughs> God is is everything. And he, 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 perspective comes in. He recognizes my kingdom is short-lived. God's kingdom is eternal. My will is subjected to his will. I mean, we get a really beautiful lesson here in this little statement of his testimony as he's testifying to the world what has happened. Now, let me keep going. So at this time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. For all of his works are true, his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who who walk in pride. I think we just saw the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. I think we went from sort of culturally associated with Yahweh to I am submitted to Yahweh. He has sovereign rule over me and my life. Uh, he's humbled me thoroughly, and I appreciate the humbling. And I'm a the opinion that someday we'll run into Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. And it, it, it might be, just might be, the most impressive testimony in human history. You ever thought about that? I was trying to think of modern correlations. And uh, if Xi Jinping, the president of China, came out and announced that, hey, I attended a church service last Sunday... And I have given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want all of China to know that I am now a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. That would be astounding. Or if Kim Jong-un, the brutal president of North Korea, both of these countries, of course, avowed atheistic countries, both these men, especially Un, has ultimate power. He can kill whoever he wants, anytime he wants. If he were to announce to the world that I, I attended one of these little house churches, of, I, I, I kill them when I find them, but I attended this one, and I heard this message of the gospel, and I realized I am not the sovereign, God is the sovereign, and I've come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those wouldn't be any less remarkable than what we just read. In fact, I would suggest what we just read, because of his dominance over the world, and the profound way in which God said, I'm going to humble you in this most unique way, might be the most astounding and powerful testimony in, the, in human history. But I want you to step back just a second and recognize, any time God humbles the proud and draws us to himself through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a miracle. Because we are, by nature, in rebellion to God. By nature, we say, his laws don't apply to me. Uh, his, his will is not the best. My will is better. I, I will demonstrate to God that I really don't need his son to die on a cross for me. I'll just do lots of religious stuff. And I'll show God how good I am. All of that, all of that is rooted in pride. You can only be saved if you have been humbled. If you come to your wit's end, if, if you are grazing on the grass of humility, then God can raise your eyes to him and go, okay, it is not me, it is him. There's some in the room, myself included, that came to Christ early on. My parents were faithful to explain the gospel to me and 
we attended a church like this one where Sunday school classes were teaching me the gospel, and I came to faith early on. And, you know, my, my story of conversion is polar opposed to Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, I mean, I, I lived a sinful life until I was five, but I, I don't want to tell you about it. <laughs> and there's a temptation for me to say, oh, it, is it really that miraculous what happened to me? Well, live with me for a while. And you'll recognize pride is the issue. And it is miraculous that God saved me, and it's miraculous that God saved you. Second thing I draw out of this is that Nebuchadnezzar did something amazingly hum humble. He recorded this story for us. I don't know if Daniel would have, um, but Nebuchadnezzar said, let me write this down. I, I want the world to know this. I want to testify that there is a God who will reign eternal, and he can humble the most prideful of men. And he took his most embarrassing moment, and it's not just he used the wrong word. For seven years, people were talking behind his back that he's a cow. For seven years, he... He lived in this humility, and he's happy to share it with the world. Now, you've heard me harp on this before. If Nebuchadnezzar takes the time to record his story, maybe we should take the time to record our stories. Uh, for lots of good reasons, and I'll repeat myself again, but as one who's done probably over 100 memorial services... One of the most frustrating things is to ask the children, did, did mom know Christ? And they're like, I don't know. You know, I, I think, but I don't know. I, or I'll say, how did, how, did, uh, how did she come to Christ? Huh, I don't know. We just always went to church. You're, you're not doing your kids and your grandkids or your pastor any favors. Record your story. Tell your story. Share your story. And yours isn't going to be nearly as embarrassing as this one. Um, but I think it's worthwhile for us as followers to take Nebuchadnezzar's lead here and say, I'm going to write this out. I want to make sure that it's recorded in such a way that I can speak it clearly, that if my kids find it in my notes after I die, they understand how I came to Christ, but tell them before they find it in your notes. Um, if I were to call you up here and say, hey, we'd like to hear from you today and tell us about Jesus and how you met him, you'd have your story ready. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll start doing that. <laughs> tell your story. And the third thing is this. you got to believe a guy's story. Um, I'm guessing Nebuchadnezzar didn't change every rule and every law and every principle in the nation of, of Babylon. There was probably still abuse and still injustice and still lots of things. But I'm also guessing that Nebuchadnezzar began to change. Um, he, he, you can't not change when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but I see a principle sometimes. Those that were really big sinners by cultural standards, we have a much harder time believing that they're actually saved and there's sanctification taking place in their life. I think there's a tendency for us to hold a higher standard on bigger sinners. And I think that's really unfortunate because in, I'm, I'm using the adjective bigger. I, I, maybe I should say more public sins, more socially unacceptable sins, but we're all made of the same stuff. But it would be these very men and women that are coming out of this wretched world that need our love and need our support, need our guidance, need our belief in them. And I, I would like to think that Daniel came alongside Nebuchadnezzar in the remaining years that he had left and discipled him and cared for him and, and didn't always bring up his past and let him get out of his past and let him live for a future in obedience to Yahweh. And that's what we need to do with one another.
if God can forgive us, we have to forgive each other. And I would suggest what keeps us from forgiving each other? Pride. You know, well, your sins are worse than mine. I, that's pretty obvious to everybody that I've told them about. Um, it's pride that keeps us from forgiving those that have even sinned against us. And we have to come back to the understanding of the gospel that God had no good reason to forgive any of us, but in a very costly manner, he provided for forgiveness through his son's death, burial, and resurrection. And he's forgiven us completely. And he doesn't hold our sins against us. He doesn't remember our sins. And yet we often hold people's sins against them. And I, I think, if nothing else, we have to say Nebuchadnezzar was a great sinner. But if he found faith and forgiveness, we have to believe him. And we have to help him move forward. So there's probably a Nebuchadnezzar in your life somewhere. Someone that you're like, okay, I'm holding that against them. I need to believe they've come to faith and I need to help them grow. I need to help them move forward. So today we see a, a, a miracle. We see this pride-filled guy humbled in a very unique way. And don't forget that that humbling, as brutal as it was was the ultimate expression of love, grace, and mercy. Because had God not brought that seven-year humbling to him, he would spend eternity apart from God, facing the wrath of God, facing the judgment of his sins, facing separation from all that is good and holy and loving. But because of that conviction and that seven-year period, now he spends eternity in the presence of God, as a family of God. God's circumstances in our lives that bring us to him are the most gracious thing that he does. And sometimes we fight him and we fight him for others. We, we should say, God, thank you for the humbling that brought me to you. Have you been humbled? Have you believed? Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for this story. Um, we, we now recognize that you put Nebuchadnezzar in the place that he was for your purposes, but you blessed him with your salvation. So right now in this room, you understand where each of us are. And you want to bless with your salvation those that will look up and humble. Humble themselves and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Give power to look up today and save us from our pride. We come in Jesus' name. Amen.